When I was a kid, I loved going to the arcades. The games there represented a major step up technically compared to what I was used to back at home on my Commodore 64. And one of the earliest games that really impressed me in the arcades was Nintendo's Punch-Out. Released originally in 1984, it featured dual screens, fast arcade boxing action, and excellent digitized speech. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing in the red corner, Paul Paul. But I always wondered, could the Commodore 64 be able to play digitized speech and samples just like in the arcades? Technically, it didn't seem possible. The C64 sound hardware was powered by MOS Technologies 6581 sound interface device, or SID chip. The original SID chip would be one of the most influential and the best sound chips going around at the time when we talk about home computers. It was a step up above the competition and it was one of the major reasons why the Commodore 64 is one of the most successful home computers ever released. Its graphics and sound capabilities were very advanced for its time. And it's also said that the machine was one of the major influences in establishing the demo scene, which is still going strong to this day. The 6581 SID chip would feature three separate programmable channels with an eight octave range. Each channel can be programmed with a specific waveform, including sawtooth, triangle, pulse, and noise. There's also low pass, high pass, and band pass filters. And there's also specific volume controls for each audio channel. In the right hands, the SID chip was capable of some incredible things. Especially when you compare the specs to the Spectrum Buzzer Audio or the YM chip found in the Amstrad CPC. But make no mistake, the Commodore 64 and the SID chip is not arcade hardware. And I believed at the time that no home computer was even capable of outputting digitized speech or sound samples. I didn't even know how it was even possible. I just assumed that Punch-Out had some type of tape recorder or tape machine internally in the arcade cabinet that would play sound samples on cue. At least that's what I believed. However, that very same year in 1984, my world would completely change when two games released for the C64 that did the unthinkable. Another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. <laughs> These two games, Impossible Mission by Epix and Ghostbusters by Activision, both released for the C64 in 1984 and contain digitized speech. While by today's standards, these both sound pretty crude, at the time, this was incredible to consider. The SID chip, as we mentioned above, has three programmable oscillators, but has no concept of PCM audio or pulse code modulation, which is the common method used to digitally represent sampled audio signals. PCM audio would appear later when Commodore released the Amiga 1000 in 1986. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that Impossible Mission and Ghostbusters were the first. However, they were both extremely popular and my first experience with digitized speech on a home computer. It also put a challenge out there to other SID composers to go beyond the capabilities of the hardware to find ways to play digitized samples in their audio tracks. Martin Galway would use drum samples on the intro to Arkanoid. Or how about Geron Tell's Turbo Outrun title track featuring many different samples mixed together. So then, exactly how is it possible to play digitized sound samples on the C64 without additional hardware? Well, as it turns out, it's all thanks to a bug that was found on the 6581 SID chip. So as always, to explain what this bug is, let's take a quick look at a Commodore 64 basic program that simply generates some noise on two different voice channels. Well, I guess the first thing is, let's go ahead and run this program so you can get an idea of what it sounds like. So you can hear there's that siren type sound, right? And to quickly kind of go through this program here with you, um, the first line here on line 10, let's uh, move the cursor up. The first line here is initializing all the SID values. Now, you're probably wondering, well, what, what are these 54272 to 54296 values? So to explain that, if we take a look at our SID memory addresses, 
you can see here that these addresses here begin at 54272 and effectively go all the way down to the last value here, which is 54296. We're telling our basic program just to zero out all those values in preparation to play some, some sound, right? So the next line here, line 20, we're setting the volume the kind of the, the main master volume to be five. Now you can see here zero is off and 15 is max. And so if we go ahead and change that volume from five to 15. So internally, that's the maximum volume that you can set the SID to be. Now, if we turn it to zero, you may notice that there's a little bit of a pop at the start before the the kind of the siren sound runs. Take a listen again quite carefully. So there was a little pop that started at the beginning and this effectively is the SID bug that we're talking about, the volume bug, if you will. So let's go ahead and try to isolate what I'm talking about here. If we say poke five, four, two, nine, six, comma zero. So what we're saying here is we're setting the volume to zero, and then we say line 20, poke, five, four, two, nine, six, comma, 15. So we're setting the volume to zero, and then we're setting the volume to 15, or four bits, which is maximum, right? Which is the maximum that we can have. And let's go ahead and run this. You hear that pop sound again. And now if we say 30 go to 10, you can hear that it's generating tone it's generating a noise right it's generating some type of sound and we're not actually messing around with any of the voice channels at all on the SID we're just manipulating the volume okay so we know about the volume bug that generates a pop but how does that translate to playing digitized audio samples on the Commodore 64 well let's talk about that in our example we were adjusting the master volume when we poked the volume register at address 54296 and as a reference in hexadecimal that address is d418 we also said that this value only accepts a range of 0 to 15 this means that it's four bits wide when the volume register is adjusted what's actually happening is that the dc voltage is being adjusted on that register and sending these signals to the speakers and as it happens this is exactly how a cd player or an mp3 player sends signals to a pair of speakers the job for loudspeakers is to take these adjustments in DC voltage and turn that electricity into sound. And with this, it should be possible to write a program on the C64 to take a sound sample and play it back on the C64 simply by feeding the sample data to the master volume register at D418 or 54296. So as always, let's test this out for ourselves and see if it works. The first thing that I'm going to do is record a little piece of audio using Audacity. Let's replicate the classic line from Impossible Mission. Stay a while, stay forever. Now, before we do anything else, we need to downsample this audio. Remember, we said that the volume register is four bits wide, accepting values from zero to 15. This means that we need to convert this sample from 16 bit stereo to just four bit unsigned mono. So we can output those zero to 15 values and we can plug this into our master volume register. Unfortunately, Audacity has no native way as exporting out as 4-bit unsigned. However, thanks to the amazing C64 community, there are homegrown tools that you can use to manage this for you. And I wanted to give a huge thanks to YouTuber Hey Bert, who's written his own converter. And I wanted to call out his excellent YouTube channel, and he's made a great two-part series on Digi sound samples on the C64. Much more technical than mine, and explains step-by-step how to create your own Digi sound samples. I'll leave a link to those videos in the description below. Once we have our 4-bit unsigned sample, we can now test out this theory. So let's first try it in BASIC. Now I'm using CBM Project Studio, a very cool modern way to develop on the Commodore 64 without needing the hardware. And if I write a simple BASIC program that imports our 4-bit sample in as raw data and then set the low 4 bits to the volume register and loop it, it sounds like this. Just a random bunch of noise. It doesn't really sound like anything in particular. However, because we're trying to handle this in BASIC, it's painfully slow. 
So what happens if we speed up that sample? Well, it's still very much a jumble of noise. You can begin to make out the sound sample. Take a listen to the original once again, and then take a listen to our basic program. Stay a while. Stay forever. Now, of course, BASIC is not really the preferred way to handle things that require precise timing and bit shifting. So here is the equivalent code in assembly language. Without going too deep here, it's essentially doing what the BASIC program is doing. However, it's doing a little bit more bit manipulation and setting up a delay so that the audio can sound cleaner. And the result is pretty decent. Take a listen for yourself. Stay a while. Stay forever. Stay a while. Stay forever. Stay a while. Stay forever. And with that, we've played our first ever sound sample on the Commodore 64. Now, I'm not an expert in audio signal processing and fast Fourier transforms, but to be very clear, this is crude, and there are much more sophisticated ways and code that can be written to play digi samples that sound much cleaner than this. However, this is the basic theory behind it, and it's all thanks to a bug on the 6581 SID chip. Now, some of you may be aware that if you try to play real samples on the C64, they may actually sound quite soft. And this is because Commodore phased out the original 6581 SID chip in favor of the newer 8580 that's found on the C64C, effectively fixing the issue with DC voltage offsets on the master volume register. Take a listen to a comparison between the original 6581 and the 8550. There's a huge difference here. However, the good news is that this has already been sold for because the 8520 also has its own ways to play sound samples. Sending data to the volume register is one such method. However, other methods for playing samples have been discovered that can allow for higher quality samples to be played. For example, it's possible to use a triangle waveform and resetting the oscillator with an undocumented test bit originally implemented for factory testing. To be completely honest, this is a much more advanced way of doing things, and it's over my head. However, the TLDR here is that amazing things were done on the SID chip that the hardware was never meant for in the first place. And of course, it's usually the demo scene that leads the way with these types of discoveries, none more so than this very famous demo that demonstrates audio effects in real time. So in conclusion, the Commodore 64 is certainly not the only 8-bit micro that could play digi samples. Smart developers have managed to pull it off on most machines of the era, and it's a topic that I do want to cover on other hardware, particularly the Nintendo Game Boy, as it has similar limitations in its audio hardware. But with that, we are going to leave it here for today's episode. I do hope you enjoyed this deep dive and nerdy look at C64 digi samples, and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, if you like this episode, please don't forget to leave me a like, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.